Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we are joined by the Canadian High Commissioner and former clerk of the Canadian Privy Council. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ms. Janice Charette. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Anna, for that uh, introduction. And I want to thank also the organizers of this evening for the kind invitation to be with you here tonight in this quite august chamber. Uh, as the new High Commissioner for Canada here in the United Kingdom, I just arrived in September, I found that the invitations to go to things would come in fast and furious through my office. And quite a variety of things too, different kinds of events, national day celebrations, meetings, parades, speeches, theater openings, you name it. An audience with Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> I mean, you could say you name it, so. Uh, my staff reminded me that you can't do everything. You don't want to be the high commissioner that would go to the opening of an envelope. So uh, <laughs> you have to choose very carefully. Uh, and when the request and when the, when not the request so much as I would say the opportunity to speak here at Cambridge Union came, uh, I must confess that I looked at the roll call of speakers and really seriously had me considering my response. Wondering if I should ask if, in fact, you had the right Janice. Maybe you were looking for Janice Joplin or Jean Charest. Like sometimes people get us confused. <laughs> but here I am, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I thought it might be appropriate to begin where the Cambridge Union began. It's clear in your motto, defending free debate since 1815. Your work in the society and the work of your predecessors, indeed in this very room, has been happening longer than my country has even existed. Your institution is woven into the very fabric of our shared belief in free and an open debate. As I said, my country is a bit younger than the Cambridge Union. Canada and Canadians are very proudly celebrating in 2017, as it marks 150 years since the British North America Act recognized the Confederation of the Dominion of Canada. It's our anniversary and we are planning a year-long celebration in order to mark that. My job as the High Commissioner for Canada is to promote the interests of Canada in the United Kingdom and to strengthen the ties between our two countries. We begin, of course, from a coveted position. Our bonds exist on many fronts. Fighting side by side through two world wars, we share a language, well, most of the time we share a language, a parliamentary tradition, common law, membership in the Commonwealth, and the list goes on. The dispatch box in the House of Commons sits atop a maple, a maple table that was a gift of the people of Canada to the people of the United Kingdom when it was rebuilt after the bomb damage of the Blitz. It is as true a symbol of our shared belief in democratic principles and I, as I can think of. And it also is a handy bit of trivia in ever, if ever you end up in a Canadian-themed pub quiz. Canadians also know that countries evolve and that we need to look to the future. We do not take our close relationship with the United Kingdom for granted. This is particularly true at a time when the United Kingdom is reimagining its future outside of the European Union as a result of the Brexit vote. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Not the Brexit vote, but the future of the Canada-UK relationship. What does a sophisticated global player like the United Kingdom have in common with Canada? A relative startup of a country, only 150 years old, that's best known for Mounties, for mountains, mining, and maple syrup. I don't want to dismiss those iconic symbols. They're part of the reason why Canada has been selected by a number of publications, including Lonely Planet, as the number one travel destination for 2017. So make your reservations now, because we're going to be busy this year. Of course, Canada is so much more, though, than those enduring symbols. So let me tell you about the Canada that I know. Canada is a country of innovators, not just within our vast borders, but on, with a global view. We're committed to free markets and trade at a time of growing protectionism. We are and always have been a trading nation. It started with fish in the 16th century, then furs, manufactured goods, cars being a key example, then oil and gas and other natural resources, 
and now increasingly trade and services. Today, Canada's largest and most important free trade agreement is NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, our trilateral agreement with Canada, the United States, and Mexico, in place for 22 years. Bilateral trade across the Canada-US border is worth $1.8 billion US every single day. We are each other's biggest trading partners. But we didn't just stop there, although that is a pretty formidable trading block. Canada has free trade agreements in force now with more than 15 countries, and we're in the process of negotiating eight more. Formal exploratory talks are underway with a further four. So Canada's reach is immense. We are the world's largest exporter of wheat and the largest supplier of wheat to the United Kingdom. Let me describe what this means in relation to what I understand are the four main food groups on most university campuses. I'll start with Warburton's, where every plate of beans on toast begins. Warburton's is the largest end user of Canadian wheat in Europe. Italy is the second largest user, since they can't grow enough to meet the demand for pasta. So when you dig into that spag bowl, well, chances are you're eating some Canadian wheat. It's also true of many of the noodles in Asia, so those pot noodles are likely ours too. So you high carb lovers in the crowd, you can thank Canadian wheat for that. <laughs> Another touchstone worth mentioning in a place like Cambridge is artificial intelligence. Many of the world's AI leaders, like Google's Jeffrey Hinton, and leaders I'd say both in the academic, academic world as well as at the world's most advanced technology companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, OpenAI, they came through the machine learning lab in the computer science department at the University of Toronto as PhD students, as postdocs, or as faculty. 3D animation and the most stunning visual effects in both video games and major blockbuster films like Harry Potter or James Bond use Houdini software, developed by Toronto's SideFX. This evolved into virtual reality and augmented reality that we see today in video games. As of 2015, Canada has grown its video game industry to include 472 different studios and added $3 billion to Canada's GDP, employing over 20,000 people. AI is just one example. Canada's impact on the UK's infrastructure and construction sectors has also been immense, particularly in engineering and architecture. If you're from Cardiff or from Belfast, you'll see the work of Toronto's urban strategies that created the master plans for Cardiff's magnificent waterfront redevelopment and Belfast's city centre regeneration. Of course, looking around the UK today, you should probably add talent to the list of Canadian exports. Mark Carney is the governor of the Bank of England. Moya Green is head of the Royal Mail. And of course, Cambridge's own newly named Vice Chancellor, Stephen Took, who takes up his post in October another great Canadian who will be joining you here in Cambridge. That said, if the rumours are true and Justin Bieber has a hankering to return here to the UK, I can't guarantee that we're going to ask for him back. So the Canada that I know is a hub for innovation with a highly skilled workforce, abundant natural resources and globally competitive services. We're proud free traders. And that's why we're so proud of the comprehensive trade agreement that we've reached with the European Union. We see this deal that's been more than seven years in the making, known as CETA, as a gold standard agreement. This agreement really is a model for future trade agreements. Why is it special? This deal is groundbreaking, not just in the scope of the free trade that it'll provide in goods and services, but also in the protections that it offers. For the first time in a trade agreement, Canada and the European Union negotiated to protect areas of mutual interest. Unfortunately, they aren't necessarily the angles that grab the attention of the headline writers, but they are so intrinsically valuable to this deal and to the citizens of Canada. Equally, they're the things that matter to the people here in the United Kingdom. Things like the ability of governments to regulate in respect of public health care, sustainable development, protection of ecosystems and endangered species, and the rights of workers. This agreement is on track to be provisionally apply, implemented in the coming months and for firms here in the UK uh, to be able to, to benefit from that agreement until such time as Brexit actually happens. So in this context, 
the UK's future relationship with the EU matters deeply to Canada. We're watching very closely as Brexit plays out here. Both the UK and the EU are important partners for us. Canada's trade and economic relationship with the United Kingdom following Brexit will depend on the future trade arrangements that the UK and the EU come to. Unless there be any doubt as to the extent of Canada's interest in, our, in keeping our commercial relationship as strong as possible with the UK, let me just give you a few examples of where we stand today. The UK is Canada's fourth largest trading partner and our largest partner within Europe, Canada's second largest source of foreign investment globally. This is very much a two-way street though. The UK is Canada's second most important destination for investment abroad. Indeed, there are more than 1,100 UK firms owned, controlled, or invested in by Canadian interests. These range from small, medium, to large-sized businesses selling into the UK market to Canada's public sector pension funds that have invested some 35 billion UK pounds uh, into infrastructure, to real estate, and other assets, including, for example, the national lotto operator here in the UK. Of course, trade, and free trade in particular, has an image problem right now. It's fair to say that the elements of the vote in the UK for Brexit, and I would also suspect in the election of uh, US President Trump, are both linked to a sense that these ambitious trade deals, this opening up of borders to goods and services and people, is not working for everyone. Canada is not immune to these sentiments. And political leaders, including Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, know that it is the time for us to show and not just tell people that open trading relationships are good for them and show them as consumers and for their communities and for their jobs. So people are asking in respect of these deals, what about me? Why is this good for me? Let's look at Skipton in North Yorkshire, home of Silver Cross, a great Canadian British, uh, excuse me, a great British company that invented the pram back in 1877 when Canada was just 10 years old and perhaps just out of a pram itself. So how does prosperity of free trade benefit people in North Yorkshire? Here is one way, regulation. Not perhaps the most sexy of subjects, but nevertheless important. If you want to sell a pram or a child's toy or so many other products into Canada, you'll need to demonstrate that it's safe for Canadian consumers. In this case, Canadian children, an understandable role for government. As it stands right now, only Canadian labs can test for products against Canadian safety requirements. The same stands true for the EU. EU labs test against EU requirements. So Silver Cross needs to submit their prams for testing by a Canadian regulator and a Canadian regulatory approved lab, and then wait, and then perhaps wait some more, and have their new products entry into our market stalled. For the first time ever in a Canadian or an EU trade agreement, the CETA agreement includes a framework through which safety, safety testing bodies and labs can work together to recognize the safety testing done in each other's jurisdictions. So what does that mean? That means that Silver Cross can spend less, move faster, sell more prams, and grow their company. And that means jobs. That means jobs in Skipton. And that's how we show and not just tell about the benefits of freer trade. We need to tell more of these kinds of stories to provide concrete rather than notional, dare I say, academic examples of how trade leads to prosperity for workers and for consumers. In Canada, this is very much an ongoing story. An ongoing story that great trading nations like Canada and the United Kingdom need to tell. Let me give you another example from Canada. A lobster fisherman in the beautiful province of Nova Scotia on Canada's east coast. Once CETA is implemented, the current 8% tariff on live lobster imported into the United Kingdom will be eliminated overnight. That means the fisherman's product becomes cheaper without him lowering his prices. Or, let's think about it as consumers, maybe they split the difference. Half goes to this cheaper lobster for consumers, so that yummy Canadian fresh lobster that you had perhaps over the holidays is a little bit less expensive, and half goes into the pocket of the businessman. Let's think about that client. In the UK, let's say it's burger and lobster re re uh, restaurant chain. Well, that chain is gonna pay less for their lobster, one of their two main menu items, 
That means they can earn more, perhaps expand more rapidly, open up more venues, hire more people. That means jobs. And back in Nova Scotia, those new restaurants are going to need, you guessed it, more lobster. And that means more lobster from the fishermen, me may, I may need to hire help, more jobs for Canadians. Again, showing, not just telling the benefits of free trade. I think that's what people really want to hear about. Not just from political leaders, perhaps not even from political leaders or the, or the corporate titans who run the FTSE 100 companies. We need to hear about these stories from the small and medium-sized business people across both of our countries, as well as the innovators, including in universities such as this one, and the risk takers who are the true drivers of industry and opportunity. So the Canada I know is open to the world's markets, and that's the kind of country the United Kingdom will want to work and trade with as it shows its commitment to global free trade. The Canada I know is also a proud, inclusive, tolerant country. In hard times, there's always pressures to close ourselves off and to turn inwards, to protect what is ours. In Canada, we've taken a different view. Perhaps one of the best examples of this is the Canadian approach to immigration, another Canadian model that's widely studied by other countries with managed migration systems. Canadians very much view immigration as a benefit to our country. We're a relatively young nation populated by immigrants. My mother is an immigrant that came from the Netherlands after the Second World War. My husband's grandfather came to Canada from Scotland as a child leaving a, a, an orphan, an orphanage. You rarely need to go back more than one or two generations when you're talking to a Canadian to find an immigrant in their family. But our success on the immigration file is more than just family links. We believe in a multicultural society. But, and it's an important but, we pay a lot of attention to and focus efforts on the integration of immigrants and refugees to Canada. We believe profoundly that diversity is our strength. We encourage immigrants to celebrate and honor their heritage, to keep their parents or their grandparents' mother tongue alive at the same time as we help them to learn one of Canada's two official languages. I don't want this to sound smug though. Canada has its own issues. Not everyone embraces this picture of Canada that I've described. But the more experience that we have with settling new immigrants, the better we get at it. Our population needs to grow, and the government hopes to welcome 300,000 new immigrants to Canada in 2017. And that's about the same number that we've welcomed for about the last decade, every single year. Up to 40,000 of those new immigrants to Canada will be refugees or protected persons coming to Canada, uh, looking for asylum and fleeing very dangerous circumstances. Those immigrants will come from every corner of the globe. And just to give you a sense of proportion, 300,000 new immigrants to Canada represents just under 1% of Canada's population every year for more than the past decade. Now we know that we have the luxury of geography. In addition to being a huge landmass, Canada does not face the challenges faced by countries in continental Europe of refugees flowing over our border. The High Commission in London serves as a regional hub for immigration, for processing. Uh, the members of our team were deployed for months on end to assist by participating in interviews in refugee camps in Lebanon and in Jordan to help with the screening and the intake process for Syrian refugees. Our Prime Minister, just after his election last year, assured Canadians that in this accelerated processing of refugees coming out of Syria, that the security of Canadians would not be compromised by their generosity of spirit. And the Public Service of Canada, my colleagues across government, worked tirelessly to deliver on that commitment. As of January 2nd of this year, I'm proud to say that Canada had welcomed 39,671 Syrian refugees to Canada. Our approach to emigration is just one part of our wider view on how we build a country and our communities, not just our workforce, not just our economy. That view towards immigrants and refugees is symbolic of our society. It extends to the Canadian dedication to inclusion. 
to respecting gender rights, to respect the freedom to practice your own religion, for the rights of members of the LGBT community, and the list goes on. During my time here in the United Kingdom, and I'm here for a four-year term at least, I hope to advance a couple of my own more personal priorities, but ones that I think speak very clearly to this inclusive Canadian outlook. I'm a, I'm a proud career public servant. Um, Canada's public service leads the world in the percentage of female executives. And of course, you probably heard that Prime Minister Trudeau has named a cabinet with equal representation of women and men. One of my ambitions here in the United Kingdom is to continue my efforts to support other women to take on and succeed in leadership roles. Those who know me also know that I'm an advocate on issues related to mental health. As I look around a room full of young and young at heart, energetic people preparing to take on leadership roles in this world, I'm keenly aware of the stresses that can accompany a time in your life when you face pressure and immense change. And talking to a few of you before coming in about the pressure that you face as a student at Cambridge, I can only imagine what that might be like on a day-to-day -day basis. I know that there can be also challenges in terms of accessing mental health services. So part of my goal is to make mental health part of the conversation, on par with physical ailments, as a personal priority in the coming years. I think all of us can play a role in raising awareness and reducing stigma so that those in need of help will have the confidence and the comfort to reach out and get it. So the Canada I know, proud, inclusive, tolerant, is a country that shares so many of the same values as the United Kingdom, which I think gives us a solid foundation for our partnership going forward. And finally, the Canada I know is an engaged global player. At a time when we believe that few of the world's problems can be solved without increased engagement, which is kind of political speak for talking to one another. Canada is seeking a seat on the, on the United Nations Security Council. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm, you know, chest thumping, or maybe I will enroll you in our campaign. But this desire is born of a genuine belief that Canada has something to contribute to the global conversation and that we can play a constructive role on global issues. We've taken so many leadership roles on the global stage, working to stop early and child forced marriage, leading on issues such as the battle to advance the interests of maternal and child health. A trust, as a trusted Five Eyes member and security partner, Canada has chaired the contact group on nuclear security, and we continue to work shoulder to shoulder with our allies in the fight against terrorism. So in this key time, when the United Kingdom is seeking to redefine its place in this world, I believe I can say without hesitation, a deepened and expanded relationship with Canada and all that we represent offers a tremendous opportunity and one that we very much welcome. Let me conclude with, with a sincere thank you for this opportunity. I know that I'm here in uncertain times for the United Kingdom. The Brexit vote will change the future of this country. Canada is ready to provide the support that a true friend, a longtime ally, and a future partner can provide. And I hope that I've painted for you a picture of the Canada that I know and the benefits that our partnership can provide for the United Kingdom. There is opportunity to be had in times of change. And that is true for all of you. Take advantage of the worldview that you're being given in this amazing, amazing place. This is a time to look outward, to think globally, and to advocate, using healthy debate in this room and the rooms beyond this for tolerance, for inclusion. This is where you will make your difference in these times of perpetual motion. And that, after all, is what it's all about. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Merci beaucoup pour, uh, pour m'accueillir si chaleureusement ce soir. Et j'attends vos questions aussi. Merci. Thank you very much My for um, your speech. Um, you spoke a little bit about female leadership. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, what inspired you to go into politics? Like well, first, I'm not a politician. I'm a career public servant. 
Uh, so, uh, like the UK, Canada has a very proud tradition of a non-partisan professional public service. Uh, so, what inspired me to go into leadership roles, I would say two things. Um, early on in my career, uh, I saw somebody who talked about um, love what you do. And I love my work. And so, when I had a chance to take on bigger problems, bigger challenges, more interesting assignments, I was always eager to take those on. I was never somebody that had a five-year plan and then I was gonna get this promotion, I was gonna do this job. I always sought an opportunity to do uh, interesting work with great people who would stretch me and provide me with learning opportunities. And the second thing is, I think kind of genetically, I'm predisposed to kind of run towards fires as opposed to away from them. And so when I see a problem, a really big juicy policy issue or a big gnarly issue that people are having their trouble getting their heads around, I was absolutely drawn to it. And so I think by doing those things and developing a track record, that gave me, that gave me the bona fides actually to take on leadership roles. And sort of building on that, um, all, most of the people in this room are about to start, you know, go into adult life and get jobs. I mean, have, have you got any kind of big piece of advice that you'd say to the people sort of here today? Um, I'd say a couple of things. Uh, one of them is uh, don't be, af have confidence in yourself. So don't be afraid to take on those big challenges. Um, I found I worked best in a, in a collaborative team-based environment where we had a specific task or a specific deliverable. So those can be places where you can get a breadth of experience and not necessarily get locked into a, to a single job. And uh, as I was saying to somebody a little earlier, choose your life partner very carefully. <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a joke, but trust me it isn't. Because uh, the person, you, you, sure you're in an office a lot of your life, but the person who you count on, who you can go home to if you choose to have someone uh, at the end of the day, uh, who is there for you, who is supportive of your goals, who will be there to kind of celebrate your successes and pick you up on those days when aren't so great, when they aren't so great. That's a huge, that was a huge part uh, of my success, uh, having that kind of a, a person at home. And uh, I, I, he would say that, uh, that we're a team. And I think that that has absolutely been uh, a critical ingredient for my success. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Yep. Hey, um, <coughs> I'm Tom. Oh, sorry, I'm Tom. Uh, it's just Where a question from, about. Tom? Hi, um, from Cambridge. Weirdly, Cambridge. so I'm uh, like actually. So you travelled a long way to get. Oh, here, yeah, right? yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, uh, yeah, um, it's a question about CETA, actually. Okay. Um, during the referendum, the European Union referendum campaign, I don't know much about CETA, but CETA did come up quite a bit, mainly being compared to the uh, trade deal with the Americans, the uh, Transatlantic TTIP. Trade and Investment Partnership, that's mm -hmm. the one. Um, I was just wondering um, whether you had anything to say on how CETA was different from TTIP and whether it addresses some of the concerns people had relating to how TTIP would affect regulation within the European Union and things like that? So I'm not an expert in TTIP, mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you a little bit about the Canada-EU trade agreement. And I think it's something that I talked about in my remarks as well. So free trade agreements have become about more than the tariff barriers between countries, whether it's in goods or services. That's an important part of it. And so, you know, as we move to provisional application of this agreement, 98% of goods and service, the tariffs on, on, on goods are gonna drop kind of the day the agreement comes into provisional application. That means prices go down or costs go down. So that's important. Increasingly, they're about how we facilitate trade between our countries, how we, the regulatory standards example that I gave you. But it's also about protections. And that's why I talked about the ability, it protects the ability of governments to regulate. Uh, and that, I think, is what, that's one of the things that we heard through the debate on, on the CETA agreement, is that, uh, you know, Canadians uh, have a, a huge amount of pride in our public health care system. And so um, we wouldn't want anything or in a trade agreement or an economic agreement that would put at risk the ability of governments in Canada to be able to 
to regulate in respect of protect and, and, and make policy decisions in, in respect of, of uh, that healthcare system. Similarly, environmental protections are workers' rights. So I think that, uh, and that's, th this is new. We haven't really seen that kind. We've seen side agreements in the past which deal with things like labor or environmental standards, but putting them right into the agreement, I think, is really meant to try and address those concerns. Now, people don't understand the agreement very well. I think that's where we have a lot of, we have a lot to do to try and help people to understand and build awareness about what it actually means. Do we have any more questions? Yeah, at the back. Yeah, hi there. I'm happy to hear a lot about the trade developments, but I was also interested in uh, maybe the immigration policies sure. that, that Canada might be looking to advance now, that if the UK is looking to make itself slightly more independent from, or a lot more independent from the rest of the EU, is there a position for Canada to enter into a closer relationship immigration-wise than it's, than it's had in the past? Um, you know, every country really has to decide for itself what its immigration policy is going to be. Canada and the UK have had a history of collaborating on what I think about as the mechanisms or, or some of the modalities of immigration. But you have to decide basically for your country what your immigration strategy is going to be. And I think that's what I've heard Prime Minister May talking about is a managed migration system for the United Kingdom. In the Canadian case, uh, this is a conversation that we could have, you know, that would take us two hours, but let me try and get it down to its essence. We have a system of permanent immigration to Canada as well as temporary. So temporary is probably the easiest one to explain. Anybody who wants to come and study for in Canada uh, needs a study visa, depending on where you're from in the world. You need a study visa. You want to come as a, a temporary entrant from some countries in the world where we have a visa requirement. You'll need a, uh, where there may be uh, questions about whether or not the the documentation from that country is totally reliable, you'll need a visa. So those are people who come in and out for a, for a defined period of time. If you come to Canada as a permanent immigrant, you become a permanent resident of Canada, you can come either for economic reasons, you can come as a refugee, or you can come for family reasons, for family reunification. Uh, and so um, it is a blended immigration model, I would say, and we really do open it up to the world. You'll see people coming from all over the globe to Canada. Uh, we are obviously in, a, in the economic categories trying to meet where we think emerging labor market requirements are going to be, but it is important to us to process the reunification of spouses and, and, and children as it is to think about our economic migration. And so uh, that's a model that works for us. It's, uh, uh, it has been extremely successful, and it's also, I think, probably one of the most important ingredients is that it is well accepted by Canadians, and I think that uh, what we see now is immigrants go right across the country to all provinces and territories. Provinces are increasingly involved in the immigration business. They're, uh, they're helping to select. They're very much helping to, with the settlement processes. A key ingredient of success in Canada is helping, to, uh, helping immigrants to learn language skills so that uh, whether they're speaking in English or French, they can actually speak not just the, the language of the street, but the language of work, because that obviously is, a, is defining in terms of uh, their ability to integrate economically as well as socially. So one of the greatest joys, I'd say, I was a former deputy minister or a permanent secretary in the UK system of immigration, and I would go down to the hockey rink. It's such a Canadian story. But anyways, <laughs> here I am. I'm a hockey mom. So I'd go down to the hockey rink on a Saturday morning, and I'd see the parents coming in with their kids, everybody sleepy-eyed, carrying yet another, you know, Canadian icon, Tim Horton's cup of coffee. <laughs> and uh, they'd be, you know, schlepping their kids' bag behind them. And they, they were people from all over the world. And so that Saturday morning, as we sat freezing cold around the rink, watching our kids skate up and down or fall, whatever was going on, you know, that, that was an important uh, an element of, of integration into our community and our society as all the language classes and all the integration classes would be. It's a chance for people to collect, connect really on a human level. So it's, it's that inculcated into, into how, we, how, we, uh, how we live and how our societies are formed. Sorry for the corny story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, at the front here. Oh, the uh, you need a mic, sorry. 
Hi, my name's uh, Iman, I'm from Ottawa. And from Ottawa? Yeah. All right. <laughs> We're up um, the home team. You gave some you know, general advice for us, but I was wondering if you had any specific advice for those of us who want to go back and get into the public service and are just trying to get our foot in the door right now. Well, um, I would say that recruitment is a challenge in Canada's public service. We have, uh, we have a lot of doors you can go through, but it isn't necessarily intuitively obvious about which ones are actually gonna get you into the job. Uh, into the job streams. And so I think we're getting better at that now. We're, we're refining our recruiting tools. So the Public Service Commission of Canada has an open recruitment portal. Um, and we're, our managers across the public service are doing a better job of trying to understand what their human resource needs are and are working better with those recruitment tools. Uh, but I'd say um, get good grades, learn both languages, be prepared to work anywhere in Canada. And those are the tools which I think are probably going to best position you for a career in the public service. The other thing is to think about, um, you know, I think increasingly uh, your generation, if I can say that, because I'm certainly not of it, are, are forcing public service leaders and managers to think differently about the model of employment. Because it used to be you'd sign up and you'd have a public service career. And now I think increasingly we need to we need to have a system which is more encouraging of people to come in for a couple of years, maybe go out and work in an NGO, work in the private sector, uh, work internationally, and so, uh, and then maybe come back in for a couple of years. So that's, I think we need to think about ways to make our system more permeable. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we're good at entry level, mid-career, rockier, so. Um, yeah, at the back. Thank you very much, Janice, for, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, you did paint a very rosy picture of Canada, uh, which was really interesting. Uh, just, you also finished your speech in French, and obviously you're speaking in English. Just on that, obviously you've seen a lot of rise of nationalistic movements across the globe. Is there any movement within Canada at the moment of sort of separatist movements and a, a rise of nationalism between Quebec and Canada? And secondly, if you don't mind me asking also, coming back to the immigration question, um, Canada's obviously really um, acted as a role model in terms of refugee crisis and refugee integration. As your role as the High Commissioner, uh, do you see any potential to really try and push the UK government on effective forms of uh, Syrian resettlement? And I know uh, community sponsorship scheme, community sponsorship, sponsorship scheme, which Canada does so well, are you going to be looking to try and educate the UK government on doing that better, which I know they're trying to do at the moment? Thank you. So, uh, two easy questions. Um, I'll, start with, uh, I'll start with your first question. So, <clears throat> I think uh, some of you may know that in Canada we have had an ongoing challenge in terms of whether or not uh, a proportion of the population of the province of Quebec have felt whether felt that uh, perhaps their future lay outside of the country of Canada as an independent nation. And in fact, we've had two referenda on that topic. Um, and in both cases, the second one much more close than the first, but in both cases, uh, the people of Quebec chose to stay within Canada. I would say at this point in time that there is still a level of support within the province of Quebec for for that idea of independence, of, uh, of a sovereign Quebec. But at this point in time, it's not the priority of the government of Quebec. And it's not, the, I wouldn't say that there's a majority that's pushing for it either. And that's partly because the views of the people of Quebec have, have shifted over the years. But I would say also that there have been measures taken to try to better reflect uh, Quebec's interest within Canada as well. And so, um, I think both of those factors have contributed to that. So we don't see that at this point in time, but you know, I would say that in addition to national defense and the defense of the homeland within Canada, that national unity is right up there with the priorities of any prime minister of Canada. And Mr. Trudeau is uh, certainly no, uh, no slouch and no amateur in that area, having watched, uh, watched these battles fight out and fought out in Canada for many years. On your second question in terms of uh, whether Canada can, uh, can school the UK, uh, I think that uh, 
important ingredient of being a high commissioner is humility. And so uh, I would say humbly that uh, what we would like to do with the United Kingdom is make sure that our models and our methods, such as the, sp the sponsorship model for refugees, is known and understood. And so that as the UK is developing its own system of managed migration, whatever it's going to be in the future, it would understand that that is one of the tools available. And if they wanted to, to, to uh, pick up on that, if that's something that they wanted to adopt and adapt for, for the UK, that uh, Canadians would very much be, uh, be willing and able to be able to share that kind of technical expertise. You'd be amazed actually just how much conversation goes on between Canadian and UK officials at all levels across almost area, every area of public administration because our systems have so much in common. So we talk regularly about these, ki these and so many other kinds of issues, whether it's, uh, you know, I've been working in the department with the folks from the Department of Work and Pensions on things like uh, your job training schemes to see what we can learn from yours to bring back to Canada. I've t been in conversations about immigration. It's just so many examples of how uh, we have compared notes over the years and learned from each other. And I think that that's likely to continue in the future. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, two guys here. Hi. Hi. Um, I was happy and surprised to hear you talk about Canada's contribution to AI, because I think a lot of people don't know about that. Right. Um, unfortunately, as you're probably aware, a lot of that talent as the technology matured tended to move out of the country to the US and, and the UK as Microsoft, Google, Facebook, so on, started employing a lot of these people. Um, oh, sorry. And I know for a fact that many of those people would rather live in Canada if that job was there for them. Um, what can we do to attract back these sort of people? Um, and these companies are opening labs in Canada. Where are you from? Uh, Toronto. <laughs> are you a Leafs fan? Not, not connected to me at all, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking for a friend. Um, so, there's been ongoing conversations about this, sh this issue of brain drain or brain return and so on. I think that uh, Canada recognizes that we are in a global battle for talent, both to be able to attract talent to Canada and to retain talent in Canada. And so I think that uh, governments have to look, uh, whether it's at all level, from the federal government in terms of how they set things like corporate tax rates, uh, to local communities in terms of the quality of life that we offer. You know, so we think about what the overall value proposition is for talented people to want to live and work in Canada. Uh, sometimes there are other companies and other countries that will attract our talent away. Uh, but I think we're constantly working on how do we hone that value proposition so that Canada is seen as an, a, an attractive destination. Part of it is having companies with jobs for these people to work in. And so I think that uh, we need, we're doing, uh, uh, there's been a lot of work done in terms of how to make sure, I don't think Canada, I wouldn't necessarily position Canada as the most innovative country in the world, but we're sure working hard on it. And how do we encourage things like technology accelerators so that you can have an entrepreneur who has a good idea and help them to form a business that might be able to expand and maybe hire in additional people. So we do, I think, are we, uh, and technology is a challenge in business as you would well know because it kind of goes through these various cycles. Uh, and uh, so you have to, we have to kind of have a, a pipeline of new ideas and new companies and new entrepreneurs who are willing to work in this space. I think for me, the point is that this is an aspect of the innovative Canada that isn't as well known, so I'm glad actually you were able to, to pick up on it. I've had a chance to, s to see some of these uh, gaming companies. They're amazing. They are truly amazing. And uh, we're actually seeing an expansion of some of those in Canada right now. So I think, you know, talking more about the fact that actually there is a nucleus, there's a hub of these kinds of companies will also, I think, attract others. Uh, yeah, let's go with. Hi, thank you um, very much for your speech. Um, in your speech, you mentioned um, Canada's bid for a seat at the UN Security Council. Indeed. And I was wondering if you could expand on um, kind of how our global image has shifted, particularly in relevance to the fact that we did not make it onto the Security Council last time, and you would have been in the bureaucracy during that period. Yeah, thanks for reminding me about that. <laughs> <laughs> it really was really sweet of you. 
Uh, so um, uh, that was then and this is now, for starters. Um, and so yes, we did have an uns uh, unsuccessful bid for a security council seat. Uh, and so uh, we learned a lot of lessons uh, from that, not the least of which is we have to actually run a good campaign. Uh, but also I think we have to not just talk but act on the global scene. So Prime Minister Trudeau on, after his election talked about Canada being back on the world stage. That's part of how this government wants to represent itself. It wants to make sure that uh, when there are, are tables that align with our values and our interests, Canada is an active participant at those tables. This is a tough competition, right? Having a seat at the Security Council means necessarily that you are running against other countries that could be allies and friends and partners of Canada's. And so I think we have to go into this recognizing that it's a tough competition, but uh, every ambassador and high commissioner around the world knows that this is something that's very important to the country. And we'll be making sure that we are working with, you know, I'll be working with, uh, with folks here in the UK as well my counterparts around the world, to make sure that, that we explain our position, we explain why we think uh, we should be on the Security Council, we explain what would motivate us when we're there, and why we think we deserve, uh, we deserve that chance. And I think it comes down to, we think we have an important voice and something to add to the global conversation, and that's, uh, that's really what lies behind our campaign for, for, for the seat in 2020. Can I sign you up for the campaign? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, right at the back. Finally, you've been so patient, I can <laughs> see you right through there. Um, hi, I actually had a, a similar question about our Security Council bid. Um, I'm from St. John's. and St. John or St. John's? St. John's. St. John's uh, um, it's funny. That's Newfoundland. 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 Labrador, for those of you who are <laughs> um, So, first of all, my question would, what would you say our leverage points specifically would kind of be? What exactly do we have to offer on the global stage, especially since um, we are being kind of questioned and our, our image on human rights really has been uh, tarnished a little bit by our treatment of indigenous peoples, especially recently um, with the Human Rights Watch report and whatnot. So I was wondering what, exa what specific re leverage point you really think that Canada has to offer. Right. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there is, there's probably no, um, no area like the challenge that Canada has had with its, it, no public policy area that has been a bigger challenge for Canada than its relationship with uh, First Nations peoples. Um, this is, a, this is a, a challenge which has bedeviled governments for years uh, and on one on which I think progress has been more slow than any government would have wanted, certainly slower than any First Nation uh, leadership group would have wanted. And so, um, uh, it's an area of ongoing focus. Uh, it is, first and foremost, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a, a symbolic and substantive importance for recognizing that this is a government-to-government -government relationship, and that, I think, is, has been at the front of the conversations between Prime Minister Trudeau and First Nations leadership. We have to deal with real, concrete uh, standard of living and quality of life issues on reserve, whether it's access to safe, clean drinking water, it's access to housing, the quality of education, all of those issues. And so I think that uh, the other thing I think in this area is that progress is slow. It's too slow, but it's going to take a while for us to solve the accumulated problems. And so um, I think there's a recognition that that's the case. The conversation is well underway and, and initiatives are taking place to address those issues that I've talked about. That obviously, you know, we have to deal, when you think about what our leverage points are in the Security Council campaign, some of them are actually making sure that we're at the table when important conversations are going on. We're at the table when we've been very active, for example, in the UN, uh, calling on, uh, on uh, uh, calling onto the carpet uh, countries uh, for the kinds of behaviors which we think are not in keeping with our perspective on human rights. Uh, we take it to our bilateral relationships. We take it to a number of different multilateral tables. So I'm not gonna enumerate all the particular leverage points because you know that would get me out of the campaign business uh, pretty darn quickly. Uh, but I think it does come down to, as I said to the, to, the, uh, to the previous questioner, I think 
uh, it can encapsulate it, and we think we do have a contribution to make uh, in terms of uh, the model of who we are as a country and the values that we espouse. And I think that those are the qualities that we think we would bring to the Security Council uh, uh, for the year uh, 2020. Oh, uh, actually, there was at the front half, so. Hi, I'm uh, Peter from London. Hi, Peter um, from London. I'm interested to hear your uh, thoughts and comments, particularly as you mentioned it in your presentation, um, about the North American Free Trade Agreement and the uh, new administration, America's declared aim, both during the campaign and more recently, to withdraw from that. Um, and also, more generally, your thoughts and comments about the new administration itself. Another easy question. So um, the North American Free Trade Agreement has, uh, you know, it's a successor to the bilateral agreement we had with the U.S. It's an agreement that's, um, uh, that has stood us in very good stead, I would say, in terms of deepening the level of economic cooperation and integration between Canada, the United States, and Mexico. But it's not the same kind of comprehensive trade and economic agreement that, for example, we've recently negotiated with the European Union. And it's agreement that's a certain amount of time old. And so, for example, I would say that while it's got good coverage on trade in goods, it would not necessarily have the same depth and breadth of coverage of trade in services uh, or the movement of, of, of skilled professionals uh, between the countries. So there's a number of areas in which I think we would look at our refreshing or a modernizing of the North American Free Trade Agreement. So obviously, the new president of the United States has also indicated that, that he's interested in looking at the North American Free Trade Agreement to see whether or not it's working in the U.S.'s interests. So we'll have to sit down and have conversations. We're, we're doing our preparatory work, as you always would, as you think about a trade agreement, to make sure that we understand clearly where our competitive interests lie, what, uh, where, our, uh, where, our, um, where we may be interested in, in deepening uh, or broadening the applications of this agreement and thinking about the areas where maybe the United States would be interested as well to make sure that we kind of have our, our negotiating um, kind of position um, uh, clear, clear in our own minds. The other thing that I think has been really important, this is a lesson that we, that we, what we learned through the NAFTA negotiations, but I think we've been, we've been really expanding and, and, um, and uh, enhancing our, our approach is really that when you're negotiating uh, trade agreements, it's not just a government to government, that's an important part of it, but governments really, I think, have to understand the, co the, the interests of different industry sectors and different industry players. Uh, and then the case of the Canada-EU trade agreement, we had, a, uh, we had a set of negotiations with also, which also involved provinces and territories, and increasingly citizens wanna have a voice and a say in these processes. So we have work to do, I think, to make sure that well, government will have its view that we kind of bring industry sectors along and that we have an opportunity to reach out to other levels of government as well. Our economies are incredibly integrated. That $1.8 billion in trade and goods and services that I talked about every single day means that as you uh, assemble uh, a particular piece of, uh, of equipment, the, the inputs to that integrated supply chain may go back and forth across the border a number of different times. And so really understanding the nature of our economy and understanding the nature of those corporate interests I think will be more important. Uh, the relationship that Canada has with the United States, our longest undefended border in the world, is, is probably the most important relationship that we have. Um, and so uh, that's why uh, the, uh, the Canadian government and the, and the Prime Minister will be very focused on making sure that we understand the the uh, objectives of the incoming administration to build relationships with them and make sure that they're aware really of the depth of our relationship and the breadth of, of, of the shared interests that we have uh, between us. And so that uh, as we go forward and as files come up and as we build our relationship with this new administration, it's really informed by, by that knowledge and that experience. Uh, yeah, at the back. Hello, hi. Uh, hi thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Samer from Toronto. I'm just continuing from the previous question. Um, I just wanted to ask you how the CETA agreement 
is different from the NAFTA agreement in terms of natural resources like fresh water, which have been exploited in, in the past within the NAFTA agreement. There is no provision in the NAFTA agreement that deals with fresh water. Just do not believe the myths. Uh, so uh, there is no provision in the CEDAR agreement that would deal with the export of bulk export of water either. That's not been part of the free trade agreements uh, that Canada has negotiated. Fantastic. Um, we have time for one more question. So if we have one more, okay, here at the front, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi I'm Jackson. I'm from Fredericton. Um, you sorry. are not. Really? Yes. I <laughs> everyone has this response. Okay, who is not from <laughs> Canada in this room? <laughs> Three, five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry to trouble you for another question, but this oh. one's about immigration. Uh, and it's nice to hear about immigration from someone other than my mother because she's an immigration officer for the, gov the province of New right? Brunswick. Oh, excellent. And um, yeah, uh, but like, th as you probably know, that the east coast of Canada is economically challenged, uh, challenged right now, which is quite sad given that um, it used to be quite an economic powerhouse. But uh, and immigration usually tends to, to Canada usually tends to drive towards Ontario, British Columbia, Alberta, or Quebec even if they speak the language. So I was just wondering if uh, because the Canadian High Commission in London is one of the most significant pres Canadian presences in Europe potentially, if there's anything that could be done to help promote immigration to the East Coast, because as you probably know, there's a mass exodus. The, the, the age is going, the, the average age is increasing and the young people tend to move away, myself mm -hmm. included. Um, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Well, your mother called me, she'd like you to go home, for starters. <laughs> um, immigration in Canada used to be known as an MTV phenomenon, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Uh, those were the three major metropolitan centers and uh, whether immigrants landed in those cities or not, inevitably they tended to eventually uh, move to one of them. I'm not sure that's the case any longer. Um, and I think there's been a number of measures that have been taken uh, to attract immigrants, either to stay in the place where they land uh, or to seek opportunities in places like New Brunswick. One of them is that I think that uh, different provinces and territories across the country have been doing a really much more proactive job in marketing themselves. And so we actually had an immigration fair here in uh, the UK in the fall where we had four provinces from the East Coast come and actually talk about the opportunity, the quality of life, quality of education in the four Atlantic provinces, including beautiful New Brunswick. And so promotion is a part of it. But also um, I think that uh, there are programs within our immigration stream, like the provincial nominee program, where a province can actually take a share of that 300,000 uh, person target for the year and select immigrants uh, to go directly to that province. Now, whether they stay there or not, uh, that's a secondary challenge. But provinces have an ability to say, look, what we really need is we're trying to identify a nurse or an engineer or a plumber or uh, somebody who is in the AI in the AI field. So um, they'll have an ability to try and select those from our, from our inventories of prospective immigrants and, try and, and, uh, and nominate them to come directly to their province. So there is a, there's a mix of tools that are available. But uh, you know, one of the great things about Canada is uh, under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there's uh, mobility rights. And so once you're in Canada as a permanent resident, you can go and live anywhere in the country. I think that the warmth of the welcome and the successfulness of the in integration uh, help to actually uh, allow new immigrants to form, form roots and set down roots in a, in a community and that's probably the most likely way to get anybody to stay for any period of time anywhere in this world. Good question though. Fantastic, thank you so, so much for speaking to us. Thank um, you. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause for thank you. Um, so if members of the Canadian Club would like to go upstairs to the library um, after this, that would be fantastic. And others of you, thank you so much for coming and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Anna. No, not a